Cyber threats are evolving fast. And with the pandemic and ongoing global conflicts, cyber attacks on individuals, organizations and nations have been brought into even sharper focus. 2021 saw a record rise in the number of data breaches and ransomware attacks. And with one UK business successfully being hacked every 19 seconds, it seems this is a trend that's unfortunately set to continue. Cybersecurity is basic survival, and it's never been more important. So whether you're a startup or a multinational, you need to make sure you're not the weakest link in your supply chain. A data breach alone can cost a UK business on average more than £2.8 million. But the impact isn't just financial. Your reputation, business productivity and customer experience are all at stake if you don't keep your security strategy up to date. So building a successful human firewall and creating a culture of awareness so your people are up to speed with the latest threats and know what to do should the worst happen is paramount. The threat of cyber attacks is too big a job for any business to tackle alone. So now is the time to reach out, identify potential weaknesses and strengthen your defenses with next generation technology and solutions. Because cybersecurity should be a priority, a long-term investment, not a last-minute bolt-on, that will not only protect your organization, but help you to survive and thrive in the digital future. Hello and welcome to the Future Is Now Live from BT. I'm David and this time out we're deep diving into the ever-evolving cyber threats facing organisations just like yours. Cyber attacks don't come with friendly warnings. Four in ten UK businesses experienced a breach or attack in the last year and they're just the ones that reported them. So in today's show we'll get you up to speed on how to spot and stop the latest types of attack, just so your organisation doesn't become another statistic. So, helping to lift the lid on the digital threats and showing us how best to defend against them, I'm joined by some of the most experienced names in cybersecurity in the UK, from BT and beyond. We'll share up-to-the-minute intel on cybercrime to help you identify potential breaches and attacks. And we'll be showing you how to use the latest technology and solutions to protect your most critical assets. We're broadcasting live once again from the iconic BT studios in London this afternoon. So a warm welcome to you wherever you're watching us from around the world. How about we take a look at what's coming up in today's show? First up, we'll be taking a closer look at today's security landscape with BT's MD of Security, Kevin Brown, and Jennifer Roderick, Threat Intelligence Specialist for BT and the National Management Centre. We'll be uncovering the threat trends that are making the biggest waves in business right now. Next, I'll be chatting to BT's Director of Security, Michaela Hart, about some of the most notorious cyber attacks in history and in recent news and how they've left some of the UK's biggest organisations and businesses racing to bolster their security strategies. In part three, I'll be joined by BT's Director of Security Advisory Services, Tris Morgan. We'll be delving into the who, the what and the why of cybercrime. You might find that you're more attractive to cybercriminals than you might have thought. And in part four, we'll, well, as we always try to do here on the show, we'll be diving headfirst into the tech with BT Enterprises Security Product Manager Yasmin Mustafa and Safe Security CEO Sakit Modi. First, though, I'd like to introduce you to some, well, some very special studio guests. The BT Protectors work alongside BT customers, offering insights, advice and solutions to keep them safe from cybercrime. So, we have joining us here today, Lee Stevens. Hello, Lee. Hi there. Uh, we also have Steph Rosser. Hello, Steph. Hello. And also, we have Lindsay Kay. Hello, Hi. Lindsay. Fantastic stuff, and they'll be on hand to answer as many of your pressing security questions as possible throughout the show. So just post your questions on the live Q&A panel at the side of the screen. They will get them on their computers and they'll be able to answer them as soon as they can. 
Now, we've also got some polls. So, what well, the idea there is that you can help to steer our conversation in the studio to the things that matter most to you. So, how about we crack open our first poll of the day, shall we? You'll find the polls again at the side of your screen. What we want to know, first of all, is what your biggest security concern is around your organisation's cyber security. We've got a handful of options there. We've got... Uh, well, and I can see you're voting already, but we've got things like uh, external geopolitical factors, obviously very much in the news at the moment. Legacy technology, we've got increased risk with remote working, uh, security risk in supply chain, we'll be chatting about that shortly, and of course shortage in internal cyber expertise, that, that skills challenge that, that many customers, uh, well much of the industry is facing at the moment. Let us know your thoughts, we'll come back to that very shortly. Um, meanwhile, let's, uh, let's have a quick chat with our, our protectors, Lee, Steph and Lindsay. Um, I know your customers come to you with a whole range of cyber security concerns, particularly at the moment. So uh, I'm curious, we've set this poll up a moment ago and I can see people are voting. What are you, what are you expecting to see from the polls today? Lindsay? Uh, for me, it's definitely the cyber skills shortage. Yep. The cyber security recruitment market at the moment is extremely hot. There's a large war on talent. And I know many of our customers are really struggling with that, attracting and retaining the skills that they really need. Yes, exactly. And developing that skill, uh, those skills. I mean, it's, it's a great career to go into if you're starting out in your IT career, but it's finding the way to get on board with that. We'll be chatting about skills later on. Steph, what's your take on our poll today? I think with recent activity, we'll see um, quite a few high results around our supply chain. I think with customers not knowing kind of what is actually in their network, third mm -hmm. parties and, and so on. So, yeah. Yes, things getting more complicated the more whether it's a cloud service or a third-party supplier or whatever, you need to make sure that all of those links in the chain are secure, otherwise you're weakening yourself. We're going to be chatting about that, I can guarantee, later on as well. Lee, what's your take? Uh, for me, I think it's legacy technology. Mm. We know from the statistics that there's a huge number of the breaches that are caused by older technology that people haven't updated and kept in life. If there's a top fact, top absolute thing that everybody should be doing, it's keeping their devices updated, making sure they're on with the latest operating system. Those older devices really are a great place for the threat actors to get in. Yeah, don't keep on tapping later, later, later when no security updates. In fact, uh, we're going to be talking in, in a few moments, time in part two of the show, about a, a major security breach, a major data uh, breach or security incident that happened exactly as a result of legacy technology that many, many computers were, uh, were installed with. Thank you very much indeed to our uh, BT protectors. You know, I can see that many of you have been voting on our poll. How about we take a quick look at some of the numbers on the screen right now? So, um... Interestingly, right at the top, with around about a third of the votes there, is increased risk with remote working. We're going to take that into our conversation in a moment's time. Shortage of internal cyber expertise, so there's that skills gap thing coming on. Geopolitical factors, legacy technology, Lee, and uh, supply chain down at the bottom there, I'm afraid, Steph. But let's see if our conversation, we can, we can get that one going up the list. Thank you very much indeed. Keep letting us know your answers, and we'll come back to the poll again in a few minutes' time. So, in part one of today's show, we're examining the current threat landscape. And, well, who better to join us than BT's MD of Security, Kevin Brown, and Jennifer Roderick, Cyber Threat Intelligence Specialist for BT, supporting the police. Kevin, good to see you again. And you. And Jennifer, how lovely to meet you. Thank you for joining us on the show. Thank you. Uh, right, Kevin. We saw... A, a, a real rise in cyber activity as a result of the pandemic. You know, we all started working from home very quickly and what do you know, the cyber criminals followed us there. But over the last uh, few months, let's say, working patterns have changed and we've become more attuned to this hybrid working model. How are the cyber criminals following us now? Yeah, I think there's a couple of bits just to pick up. And it's great to see the uh, early results of the polls. I think it mm -hmm. right, re really ripe for our conversation. So cyber criminals, the volume, the velocity, the complexity, 
I don't think that's changed a lot, certainly in the time we've been discussing remote working now, which is, what, the last two years. I think the bit that I'm personally seeing from speaking to many colleagues, many uh, organisations, a little bit of cyber fatigue, I think, is starting to slip in now, where we've gone through the curves of lots of awareness, improvements of technology. Mm -hmm. Now we've settled into, as you said, this sort of the new norm, this hybrid ways of working. But I don't think actually our risk posture has really got to that point yet. And people are a little bit tired of the awareness. They've got used to a little bit of tech. And this is the time where the cyber criminals will look to prey on those vulnerabilities. Complacency, would you say? Is that, is that in there? I'd say complacency and just being comfortable with this hybrid style, but mm -hmm. recognising that actually as you start to use tech in different ways, you get back to perhaps old patterns of life when you're in work, yeah. the relax when you're at home, just an opportunity for us all, just to reaffirm actually what good security culture looks like. But I think one of the challenges is, is it not that we, we talk about hybrid working and, uh, and my take, my, my personal take, is that a lot of that is, is dressing up the fact that we don't really know what's next. So hybrid works for now while we make a decision as to what the, net, you know, the future really looks like in terms of working. But that means that not a lot is still settled. There's still change. There's still little creaks and cracks for cyber criminals to try and exploit. So is it a case that you know, maybe we do need to make some decisions in order to start to um, bolster those defences and make sure that all of the little chinks and cracks are as secure as they can be? Yeah, and it's, it's really tough for organisations of all sizes at the moment because I don't think anybody has really landed on what is the strategy? What is the strategy in this stage of the pandemic? We talk about coming out of the pandemic. We're, we're still seeing different effects. So it's hard. I think the one thing that I, I positive is I think a lot, a lot of organisations are a lot more agile using technology in new, in new ways. Yeah. And it's just making sure that actually the security culture as part of your business culture is going to support that. Culture. Well, I'm pretty sure we'll come to the culture versus strategy thing later on. But, Jennifer, I want to bring you in here. How have you seen the, the, this threat landscape evolve over the last 12 months as we've moved into, a, I say, a different stage of pandemic response? Yeah, so at the very beginning, everyone kind of was really having to, exactly what Kevin said, really having to just adapt quite quickly in the mm -hmm. environment. And the threat actors adapted far quicker than we did. So they really did kind of, they were immediately on to all of the platforms that we were having to do, mm -hmm. where we were having to kind of work in an environment where potentially people were working from home, schooling was at home, the threat actors were there. Mm -hmm. And what happened over the past two years is the threat actors have evolved. Threat actor groups have dissolved, they've kind of merged as well. We've also seen malware be dissolved. That's kind of also been replaced by new and more effective what, malware. And what's ended up happening is the skill transfer as well. We've seen a lot of people taking up hacking on a really basic level, but also they've started to share the expertise amongst a lot of these different groups. Mm -hmm. So what's ended up happening is a lot of groups have kind of dissolved, merged together. The skill transfer has happened. And we've seen this happen time and time again. So what's happening is a lot of these different threat actor groups, criminal groups, and actors across the whole spectrum are really kind of operating in a much more complex manner than we've tended to see. And they've targeted big international corporate groups all the way down the spectrum. And it really is now becoming a far more complex environment than we traditionally were used to. And is, is the pandemic... Um to blame for that in as much as the fact that, well, people maybe have broken out their normal patterns, maybe they've had their legitimate working uh, white hat work disrupted, so they need to do whatever they can in order to earn some money. And what do you know, we're all stuck at home. All I've got as my window to the outside world is an internet connection and a laptop, so how am I going to survive? Is, is that playing into this in, in some quarters? It, it is, and we all had to adapt. We all had to kind of go from working on our traditional desktops, potentially in our office, yeah. to potentially taking that laptop home, to potentially, actually, am I having to now do my work emails on a computer network? Am I having to also do schooling on, on this? We had to all adapt very, very quickly. We had to do things, potentially without the accesses and without the VPNs and all these different systems. Mm. And things came in potentially a little bit too late. We ended up having threat actors operating in a very different manner. Yeah. And things just have progressed so much. But also the threat actors have ended up kind of... We, we've seen things. We've seen threat actors turning against each other. We've seen threat actors evolve in a very, very different way. So they've ended up having a really difficult time as well. But it has been exceptionally complex. And it's, it's not an easy environment to navigate, even for, the, even for an individual. 
but we've seen a lot of trends happening across the range. We've seen fishing at the highest level. We've seen it happen across COVID, incredible amounts. Fishing wasn't what it was two years ago, where you were expecting it to be an obvious fishing campaign coming through. And I think that's one of the big prevalent things. Education has changed. Well, let, let, let's cast our mind forward a little bit. And uh, Jennifer, I know that, um, you know, you, you've, you have some very high profile positions or have had some very high profile positions as an advisor to the White House and, you know, helping armed forces to prevent military attacks. Lots of experience in that area. As, as you start to cast your mind forward rather than over the last 12 months back, what do you think are the trends that we're going to see over the coming year then? Yeah, so I think the protectors raised some really interesting points. And I think, actually, as we've seen from some of the polls already coming through, we've, we've kind of seen a lot over the past year and definitely going forward. I think supply chain is definitely one of those, and I was quite yeah. surprised to see that quite low on some of the polls, actually. Yeah. That supply chain is definitely one of those. Last year, we saw how impactful some of the big cyber attacks were that actually having supply chain with some of those trusted vendors that we see, whether it's on your personal machines all the way through to some of the technology, supply yeah. chain actually can cause significant impact because we've trusted these vendors so, um, um, so automatically and then suddenly they can take down things. Yeah. But it's one of those of a, and we had this question actually come in from the audience beforehand uh -huh. relating to the geopolitical situation course, and, yeah. uh, and the conflict that's currently ongoing. That has had such a far reaching effect beyond its borders. The hybrid situation that happened, not only kind of in the run up to the conflict, but as that's continued, that's spilt out far beyond the borders. And yeah. I think that's changed the dynamic moving forward. And we, you, I was going to say, hold that thought, because um, you mentioned supply chain, you mentioned geopolitical. Uh, if we can check up on the poll again now, just to see what your poll, uh, uh, poll responses are, um, we're still seeing increased risk with remote working. I was just interested to see if supply chain was down the bottom. In fact, supply chain has dropped 1% <laughs> down to 10%, and geopolitical, that's midway through with uh, one in five seeing it as, as most pressing. Sorry, Kevin, to interrupt. Yeah, I was going to say, I think on... On supply chain, I think there's a different perspective we need to look at supply chain now because historically, when you've mentioned supply chain, you look down your organisation, who supplies you? Yeah. But actually, as an organisation, most organisations have a 360 role in a supply chain. So therefore, it's now a case of looking upwards to say, well, where do I fit in this bigger ecosystem of supply chain? Mm -hmm. So whilst yourself, you can look at it in isolation and say, well, I've got good controls over the people that supply me. What about looking upwards? What threat does that then pose? And what we have seen, for example, is where there are larger organisations, particularly in the geopolitical context, where they have been targeted because of the stance they've taken around Russia. Those organisations may, may have good protections. They've invested millions to protect themselves. Yeah. So therefore, criminals are starting to say, OK, well, we're going to go after their supply chain. We want to cause the embarrassment. We want to cause disruption because we ultimately want to raise awareness of what an organisation is doing. So I would say sort of really look at your supply chain to say, what are the consequences of those supplying me? But what does it mean for those that I'm supplying to? Uh, and we have already seen some high-profile hacks off the back of the uh, geopolitical situation uh, that are, have been using that supply chain to hit third parties and, and discredit the, uh, well, the target. Um, Kevin, um, what are your concerns about how organisations are responding? You know, we, we're talking about these different threats and our, our audience today have shared their view on, on where they may be, but what are your concerns about how organisations are responding to those different threats right now? A, a couple of bits, really. First of all, I think we have to take a step back and say it's not so much the organisations, but for the UK, how is the UK responding? Because it has to be a whole-of-society uh, response. General terms, I think... It, Lots of positivity, reasons to be sort of optimistic in a, in a very challenging world. But we've just completed some research, uh, sort of the smaller uh, and micro businesses. And this is a bit where, a little bit concerning, over 70% see cybersecurity as something that must be prioritised. So you think, great, mm. real progress. Only 10% are actually doing something about it. Right. So we've still got this disconnection between the thinking and the doing. And sometimes it's tough to take those first steps to get beyond just the thinking to actually doing, uh, doing things. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer, very quickly, in a couple of sentences, you know, what are your concerns about how organisations are or maybe aren't responding? Yeah, when it comes to cyber incident response plans, we're kind of seeing the same 
thing, whether whether how small or bit large an incident is, yeah. and it really is kind of even the even kind of on the cyber um, security breach. Um, sorry, survey that came out recently, yeah. it said that nationally only 19% of companies have a cyber incident response plan. Uh, that really isn't it enough. We kind of they acknowledge, once again, as Kevin was saying, that actually cyber is acknowledged as a problem, but only 19% of companies are acknowledging that they have to do something and respond within that. And it really kind of is, uh, if we're not kind of having that acknowledgement as to treating data in the same way as we would tr yeah. treat a, a robbery or a theft, yeah. it kind of needs to be kind of hitting that point. We wouldn't accept something being stolen from, from a shop or a business in the same way that we tr are treating our data. Indeed, yeah. And it's interesting you mentioned the uh, incident response planning there. We're going to be talking about that later on in the show. Uh, of course, clear, there are many factors that go into implementing an effective cyber cybersecurity strategy, all of which leads us to our next poll question today, and that is, when it comes to your organisation's cybersecurity, where are you focusing your attention? We've got five options for you on the big screen, the giant screen there. Um, educating employees about cyber threats. Well, yes, I, I know that our BT protectors will be happy with that one. Understanding threat landscape and vulnerabilities, implementing new technology and solutions. We're talking about some of those later on. Finding the right partners to support my cybersecurity and maintaining regulatory compliance languishing down there at the bottom. Do let us know your thoughts um, and, uh, yeah, we'll come back to those poll results. Uh, poll results very shortly indeed. Right, so uh, let's crack on with the show now. Um, I would like to... Actually, Jennifer, speaking of letting us know your results, um, or, or letting us know the, the, the... Speaking of our audience, letting us know what they think uh, are the biggest threats that, that are coming in there, let's talk finally about shaping, about evalu evaluating, about re-evaluating a cybersecurity strategy. Where should organisations start on that journey? You know, Kevin says those first steps are often the hardest. Yeah, so obviously it's, it's kind of, as I said, cyber and the cyber threats is a huge, huge spectrum. And it's one of those of a, you can kind of become a bit daunted. Mm. And I, with, within our role, we kind of work with a lot of the cyber resilience centres, with a lot of the small to medium enterprises. Yeah. And where they kind of sit there and look, and it's like, with all of these threats, where on earth do we even begin? And it's, it's really difficult within this landscape to kind of become almost scaremongering with all, with all of the threats. And that's certainly not where we can kind of, within all these discussions, it's easy to become everything's, everything's a bit doom and gloom. Yeah. And that's not at all where it is. I think the biggest thing from ourselves and where, especially within my role, that we tend to come from is it has to be broken down and intelligence sharing and information sharing is key. One of the biggest roles, especially from a threat intelligence perspective, is working with others and working with other organisations to really kind of start sharing that burden. Yep. As I kind of said at the beginning of this, like the threat actors are all working together. They're sharing yeah. their intelligence. Yeah. And what we've kind of failed to do as the protectors is really kind of start sharing that intelligence on the blue side of things yeah. and to really be understanding how we can all effectively work together. And it's sharing that as a community to really start defending as one against that. And if we start to share that information, but really, as, as we can start doing that, to really understand the tactics, to start defending against some of the biggest threats, yeah. realising those education pieces so that we can start defending against them because it's been things about to do with the new phishing tactics and techniques. Mm -hmm. Once we can really understand what are, is the latest that we're all seeing and then sharing that around, it doesn't mean that it has to stay within the big corporates who understand that at the highest levels yeah. and can charge the big expensive vendor fees, but we can understand that down to the smallest enterprises that actually everyone can understand that as a community. Not all doom and gloom and, you know, talk about sharing information. We're going to be talking later on, sharing some, some new news about how uh, organisations are going to be sharing data for the benefit of us all, but for now, thank you very much indeed. Uh, let's take a look at our, our poll that we set up just a few moments ago. We asked when it comes to your organisation's cybersecurity strategy where you're focusing your attention. Well, let's take a look at what came up at the top there. 
educating employees about cyber threats. So it's that security mm. awareness training piece that really resonates right at the top. Any surprises there in our well, results? I think it, it's, really, it's, it's actually quite refreshing to hear that. But I would just come back to the question you asked around security strategy. I would frame that slightly differently to mm -hmm. say, actually, where does the security feature in your business strategy? So you can't deal with the two as separate and in isolation. It's about actually how is security being seen as your business strategy? What role does it have to play as the enabler, the protector? And I think that really helps change a cultural shift in how security is seen. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, that is it for part one. But Kevin and Jennifer, please do stick around for our Q&A later on in the show. And uh, if you have uh, any questions that you'd like to put to Kevin and Jennifer in particular, then please do post them into our Q&A panel and I will do my very best to put those to them later on. But for now, thank you very much indeed. So excited to hear how our BT protectors are getting on now. Uh, so, sorry, excuse me, sorry, very unprofessional. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm getting a LinkedIn connection request there. Just give me a second. Uh, accept. Um, right. Sorry about that. Right. So, uh, BT protectors, thank you very much for uh, sticking and us answering the questions that have been coming in to our uh, from our audience. You know, when it comes to when it comes to our, our audience's cybersecurity strategy, I'm, I'm sure that you're getting all kinds of, all kinds of questions from them. And, and I, I'm curious to know what the majority of, of our audience were focusing their efforts on earlier on. Um, I'm, I'm just going to say... Customers come to you with a whole range of concerns around online security, particularly at the moment. Um, Kevin, we saw this rise of, uh, of uh, sorry, Lee, we saw this rise in attacks during the course of the, of the pandemic. Uh, Steph, Jennifer uh, and Kevin and I were chatting through the cybersecurity landscape and trends and our audience was telling us in the polls where they felt they were most concerned about it's this challenging, dynamic environment at the moment. What is it that you can do at the BT Protectors to help your customers to manage to, to um, implement the changes necessary within their environment in order to best repel these attacks? Yeah, absolutely. So I think we, we do work with a real range of customers um, because we work across different industries, um, different sized organisations. So we do really see a wide range of challenges that our customers are talking to us about. Because of that, we really want to understand each individual um, organisation. So we work at as a kind of consultative approach, really understand the customer's infrastructure, what tools they might already have in place. Some customers know what their immediate challenges are, and so we can work on that specifically, whereas others want to kind of look at um, their overall security strategy and their roadmap with us. For some customers, they actually haven't quite defined their security roadmap and they don't know what their next yeah. steps is. If that is the case, then we can absolutely work closely with them to um, kind of identify what their next steps should be and that's the role of of a trusted partner for, for now Steph thank you very much indeed um so a few moments ago I received a, a connection request uh, on on LinkedIn from from Joe White well uh, I just received an email from him. I think he must have taken my email address from my contact details on LinkedIn. Now, I'm sure that you're all pretty switched on when it comes to spotting something that doesn't seem quite right. And, well, I'm not sure what I think about this email. Let's, let, let's take a look at it. Um, he's, uh, he's asking if I'd be interested in delivering a keynote speech at an upcoming event. Needs to know by 10am tomorrow and wants to give me a call, indeed, to chat through the details. 
I don't know about you, but I'm not sure I should do what Joe's asking. It seems genuine enough, but well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll read his email out to you, and I want to see how many red flags you can identify. And, you know, as spear phishing emails are highly targeted, they can be quite tricky to spot. So I'll have a read through, and as I'm doing that, you have one minute to vote on Slido on the screen right now. How many red flags can you identify? Let's take a look at this email. So uh, the display name there is Joe White, but the email address is... 899836. It's a lot of numbers at gmail.com. Uh, email subject, urgent request for your attendance. Hi, David. Thank you for accepting my request to connect on LinkedIn. I work for a company called Top Tech, and we're holding a special event called The Future Is Later. It's a good name-ish. Uh, in London, we've seen you... Uh, we've, we've seen you're a freelance journalist and technology reporter, and we're really impressed by your professionalism, full stop, and experience, full stop. Uh, you have the perfect balance of technical knowledge and presenting abilities to deliver a keynote speech. Uh, flattery will get you everywhere. Uh, my boss is meeting with our sponsors tomorrow to finalise speakers. It would really help me if you could confirm your attendance with her by 10am. I fear the opportunity will be missed if you do not. So, you can download details of the event here. There's a hyperlink. Uh, I can give you a phone call to talk it through in more detail this afternoon. In the meantime, uh, can I ask where you're based now and if you'll need transport? Sorry, it's late notice. Great opportunity. All the speakers will get a brand new iPhone 13. Kind regards, Joe. Well, good news is I've already got a brand new iPhone 13, so I don't need that. But it all, it all sounds pretty good, right? But how many red flags do you think you could have spotted in that email? Well, you've been voting and letting us know. So uh, I'll tell you what, let's take a look at what the red flags were. We're going to put them on the screen in red right now. So, um, well, that display name and email address, that difference looks a little bit suspect, frankly. Urgent, sir, uh, urgent subject line there and some spelling and grammar mistakes. None of us are perfect, but they all add up to this, to this picture of whether an email is legitimate or not. An offer that's too good to be true. Pressured deadlines. Uh, we also had uh, consequences for not acting now. These are typical sales, pressure sales techniques that the scammers employ. Downloads or, or links, as we saw here, that may contain some malware. And also, a request for personal information. Well... You know, I think we can all still learn new things from, from emails like this. And I can tell you that I certainly won't be planning to reply to that email anytime soon. But I'm pretty sure, I have a bit of a hunch, that our scammer's not going to give up that easily. More on that later. Which leads us very nicely onto our next poll. Thank you very much indeed for your poll answers so far. Uh, there are lots of ways that a cyber criminal can target your organisation, but which type of cyber attack concerns you the most? What keeps you up at night? Really interesting to see how this one comes out. Let's take a look at the uh, potential answers there. We've got uh, DDoS, we've got ransomware, malware, phishing, insider threats as well. And I know we'll be covering that. So right at the top, ransomware, phishing, keep your results or keep your responses coming in. Let us know and we'll come back to your responses very shortly. A data breach can cost a UK business more than £2.8 million on average. So knowing how to protect yourself from cyber criminals is, of course, vitally important. In part two of today's show, we're going to take a look at some high-profile cyber attacks that have made the front pages in recent years. We're going to try to understand the mistakes that were made and what we can learn from them. Joining me is BT Director of Security, Michaela Hart. Michaela, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Hot from Cyber UK, I think, this week. Absolutely. Hi, David. Good to join you. So, speaking as, um, as a reporter, as a journalist, when I look back on cyber cyber crime and, and, and those moments that really resonated with my audience, which is mainly on the, on the consumer side, there are a couple of penny-drop moments, I think, that, that really stand out to me. And they 
really started around about 2015. And the first one was a, a data breach. I don't know if you remember this one. It was a data breach at a, a high-profile dating site that wasn't without controversy, let's say. And it got enormous, enormous coverage. Um, we, we were writing an awful lot of stories about it at the time. But it very quickly turned sour because uh, when the names got leaked, there were some pretty dark and tragic consequences. That raised consumer awareness an awful lot um, in sad circumstances, but about the value of their data. It hit home in a really human impact way. Another one took place only a few weeks later, and that was a big customer data breach of a major, one of the biggest UK internet service providers at the time. And again, that got huge coverage across the news. I was covering it for you know, various breakfast TV channels at the time. And again, there was a real human impact story because scammers were using the customer data that was leaked to phone them up and say, hey, look, there's a virus on your machine. Maybe we can help you do that and install some software on, on their machine. And it, and it all went kind of southbound from there. But those were moments when I think awareness about the power of our data and about what can happen if that data, when trusted with a company, falls into the wrong hands. That was when consumer awareness was peaked like at no other time before. I, I, I want to ask you if there are any similar instances where you think data breaches have, have really taught us something and have really stood out? I think... Um... You know, you mentioned a couple of very high-profile breaches and the impact on the impact on individuals, the impact on consumers. Um, I think for me, the other shifting dynamic is um, that, that kind of stands out for me and the things we're trying to address today is that it isn't just the large brands now. Yeah. Um, I think we're seeing a real shift in trend um, that rather than actually, um, you know, the hackers, um, the threat actors focusing on large, high-profile brands, it's actually now much more prevalent across businesses um, of all sizes and across all um, sectors as well and so it's really becoming something that that not just the big guys have to worry about it's something that actually everybody has to worry about and I think that's a real shift that we've seen over definitely you know the last 12 to 18 months yeah so any any specific instances where you've you've been aware of of a thing that's happened a, a breach or, or an incident that's happened that you think that, well actually it, it's sad that it happened but we can take something from that perhaps Yes, yeah, so I think there's a few examples in, in recent times. Um, one actually sort of back in, in the autumn um, was uh, a borough council um, was actually compromised. They, um, they, they were attacked and data was actually stolen from their organisation and that was both employee data um, but also, you know, residents of that borough's data um, was compromised as well. Um, and I think sort of the, the big learnings from that was, A, it was just the, the impact um, on actually regular everyday services. So not just the data was compromised but business business was interrupted as well. So actually, they couldn't complete housing transactions um, in that borough. A lot of people's, you know, house purchase was, was delayed. Um, they actually couldn't make payments. So they couldn't pay out the family tax credits um, that they were due to pay out. Um, and the pressure that put on the teams yeah. that was responding to that was enormous. And actually, you know, they, their sort of organisation talks about just the feeling of guilt, actually, um, at the sort of the knock-on impact to, to just not just their staff, but also um, to the residents of that borough. Yeah, it's, it's that human impact piece, not only on, say, those residents that, that couldn't access services, but also, and, and this often, I think, gets forgotten about, the people who were working in the organisation that were suffering that, that breach, they were trying to do the right thing but found themselves in an impossible situation in many ways. Yeah, they were. I think the, the pressure on them was enormous and, and they did talk about, you know, the well-being of that team that were responding um, and how they felt responsible, um, but also under huge pressure to respond. And so I think sort of, you know, they talk about the learnings um, from that incident was actually, you know, how collectively can people work together? Yeah. So how can actually all of the boroughs work together? How can they share? learning um, to be able to respond actually as a as a broader community um, but also we touched on earlier you know sort of basic hygiene the challenge of legacy and so for them it was yeah. being aware of you know they found legacy systems in their organization they found things that were out of date so it's actually you know it took them more than 12 months to fully recover um, and to sort of get back to where they felt they, they were in a, in a in a really good position so on, on that legacy point, and we've raised it a few times today, but I look back on, on another very, very high-profile breach, um, WannaCry, 
uh, and, and that ransomware attack that impacted similar human in, uh, human impact it impacted so many NHS computers you know hundreds of thousands of systems around the world but that propagated as a result of a vulnerability in legacy versions of the Windows operating system and the the point there the lesson there is that that vulnerability it had been patched or a patch had been provided by, by the vendor, but by Microsoft, but it hadn't been deployed across many of the systems. Uh, and in fact, there were some systems that were still running that were end of life, for which at the time there was no patch available. And so that legacy system issue, I think there are, are, are fewer examples of where that really can be a big problem than the WannaCry ransomware attack. Yeah, no, that, that one was incredibly high profile. And, and also, more recently, we had sort of Log4j. Um, and I think it really made people sort of consider, actually, you know, what legacy systems they've got, actually their sort of life cycle management of those systems. And if systems can no longer be patched, then they don't really have a place in the infrastructure of the organisation because they are going to be an ongoing vulnerability. Yeah, and of course, it's not just about the larger organisations. It's easy for us to talk about those, but there are organisations of all, of all shapes and sizes and, you know, indeed, many small and medium businesses make up the, the bulk of, uh, of the, the number of organisations in the UK. And so it's, th there are challenges that are different when you're a small business to when you're a large organisation in terms of bolstering your cyber defences. Yeah, the, the most definitely are. I was talking with um, with the, the sort of owner of a, a small business recently, um, 75 employees, a software development organisation. They kind of felt that they were in an OK position. Um, they, they were actually attacked. They suffered a, a breach and they didn't realise until James from the NCSC called them to tell them yeah. that they'd been compromised. The first thing they did was think, well, James was scamming them. Um, <laughs> but once they actually got through that, it was actually that it had been identified and the NCSC shared with them that actually it was uh, an e a legacy email address of, of an ex-employee that had been right. used as the route into the organisation. And they really, you know, they felt that they were small and that they wouldn't be um, compromised, they wouldn't be subjected to a ransomware attack because they were not a very big organisation. Um, and the learning from them, you know, they stepped through and the NCSC actually helped them create an incident response plan um, and worked through that with them. Yeah. Um, but I think sort of the learnings from that one um, is that actually, and, and, you know, Jennifer referred to earlier, having a, you know, having a cyber incident response response plan yep. and that traditionally has been the domain of very large organizations but now organizations of all sizes need to think about that um, and then it is something that you can you know create yourself um, the NCSC published templates yes. um, and it's something also that you can work with with partners on um, but I think it's super important that everybody and uh, you know invests some time in having that incident response plan so they know what to do we're gonna be picking up on that instant response piece in a, in a few moments time with Tris but uh, how about we take a look at the results of our poll now we're asking where your security concerns were and well we were talking about ransomware want to cry and elsewhere and that's right at the top uh, 58 percent followed by by phishing which obviously can be a way of of getting ransomware into into an organization uh, ddos inside a threat down there at four percent well let's see let's see where that takes us in a few moments time um in terms of responding to these kind of these kind of threats you know you always say that uh failing to plan is planning to fail and you've got some simple ABCs to help organisations get in the right mindset when it comes to making those plans. Yeah, so I think for me, the sort of the ABCs. So the, the first one is action. Mm. Um, so actually, you, you need to have an action plan. You need to be ready to respond as soon as you're aware that something is happening. Yep. And so again, having that cyber incident response plan is absolutely critical. And who's responsible for what in the organisation? Um, that's a really important part of that plan as well. Who's going to make the decisions? Um, I think that that's the first thing. That's my A. Um, my B is about business resilience. Um, we've talked a lot about ransomware. But actually, DDoS attacks, for example, can mm. stop you being able to actually, you know, sort of function, engage, to digitally transact with, with customers and systems you depend upon. So what's your business continuity plan? What's your business resilience plan? How are you going to keep running? You know, often um, it can take businesses more than five days to recover from a DDoS attack. Um, so where, where's your business resilience plan in this? Um, and then the C for me is about communication. Mm -hmm. um, so how you communicate, how you communicate internally, how you communicate with your customers, if customers have indeed, if data has been lost, um, 
colleagues and then actually also you know who you need to report the breach to if sensitive data has been lost so having a really robust communication plan underpinning yes. the a's and b's is critical yes abc's love a good uh, love a good abc <laughs> to help me remember things uh, but michaela for now thank you very much indeed and if you have any questions for michaela do pop them into the q a panel she'll be joining us later on hopefully to answer them thank you very much for now so, uh, the BT protectors have helped lots of organisations deal with the aftermath of a cyber attack. Uh, hello, Lee. Still busy there tapping away, responding to, uh, to what our audience have been asking today. Um, Michaela and I, we were just chatting about how various industries have uh, been, been targeted by well, threat actors uh, of various types in various different ways. Um, you have a way, don't you, of helping an organisation to understand who their cyber adversary is. So tell us a bit more about that and why knowing who your attacker is can help you to defend against them. Yeah, we're big fans of uh, a thing called the MITRE attack. It's uh, a, a thing set up by a group called MITRE in the US. Uh, it's a common body of knowledge of the tools, techniques and procedures that we know threat actors are using to target uh, individual organisations out there. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's uh, crowdsourced from a whole variety of different places, almost like a Wikipedia, if you like, mm -hmm. uh, of how to get in uh, to, to, uh, uh, to compromise somebody. So it's a great mechanism to learn a lot about which organisations will be uh, targeted in which ways, uh, and we use that to help uh, understand the likely threat vectors uh, that need to be defended against. Uh, and very quickly, how can your customers then determine whether the defences they have in place can stand up to those incoming threats? So the ideal thing then uh, is to overlay against that threat model uh, a view of the mitigating controls and technical things that are in place uh, in order to protect the organisation. Uh, in our service, that essentially builds a heat map that shows where we've got good coverage and everything's all OK. Where there's some specific gaps, obviously we might need to put some more investment, put some alternative mechanisms in place, or, or even in some cases where there's double coverage, where we could perhaps scale back things in order to uh, reassess the money. And whilst that does change by industry, it does give us a very good way of understanding what should be the priority items, what things should customers consider yeah. first, uh, and try and focus their attention. There's a huge number of things that could be done, but picking the right ones to go for definitely makes a big difference. Thank you very much indeed, Elaine. Well, sorry, bear with me. Ah, right, so our scammer is back. I think they've obviously got it in for me. Uh, so, actually, I wonder how they got, they got my telephone number. Anyway, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to go along with, uh, with our scammer's call, but I want you to see how many red flags it would take you before you'd put the phone down. We've got the Slido on the screen. Tell us when you would have finished the call. There are time codes when the warning signals kick in. Let us know what you think. But meanwhile, uh, hello. Hi, David. It's Joe here. I emailed you this morning. Hi, Joe. How are you doing? Yes, as I mentioned, we're very impressed with your technology experience and TV appearances on Rip Off Britain and Watchdog. Uh, David, I think you'd be perfect for an event we have coming up. And as I mentioned in my email, you'll get a brand new iPhone 13 for taking part. Well, I'm pretty booked up at the moment. Uh, pretty busy at the moment, truth be known. But um, quickly, tell, tell me more about it. Sure, sure. Uh, but before I do, David, can I just confirm where you're based? It's just we need all our speakers to be pretty close to the venue on the day. OK, I'm in uh, South London. Ah, OK, great. Nice and close. Mm. Actually, what's your postcode? We uh, might only be a few stops away from you. Right, right. So Sorry, before we go on, um, can I just ask what event this is for? Because uh, I don't recall that you mentioned it in your email. Sure, sure. Sorry, David. Um, yes, it's in three weeks, which isn't long. Mm. I'll tell you what, you don't have to commit now, but if we at least get you on the system before the deadline, I can make sure you get first refusal. Then I'll run through the details of the event. It'll take, what, ten seconds? Right. I, could you just tell me one more time where you're calling from again? Uh, sure, yeah, it's uh, Top Tech. Mm -hmm. I think you've worked with a few of my colleagues before, uh, right. Sorry to press, David. I, I, know, I know I've got it here somewhere. Um, but can you remind me of your sort code and account number? Um, can I ask why? 
It's just we have a policy of always paying artists 50% up front, and with the event so close, I wouldn't want you to miss out. Hmm. I think it's time I put the phone down there, don't you? Uh, right. Uh, do you know what? It felt more intense in a call, didn't it? You know, I, I think you could hear that he was, he was pushing for more information. And, you know, in a situation like that, it's very easy to reply without even thinking about it. But I had my guard up also much sooner than I would have done with an email earlier on. I think that's because we're able to read situations far easily when, when we see people. Uh, when people engage face to face on the phone, they're only likely to share personal information around about 45% of the time about themselves. And that jumps up to 80% on social media. Also, before the call, I did wonder how Joe got my contact number. And of course, he could have got that maybe from a LinkedIn profile or maybe on a breach somewhere on the dark web. So it is important to stay vigilant at all times. Here are some ways that you can verify if your caller is genuine. Um, authenticate the caller, do an internet search uh, uh, on the number, ask if you can hang up and then call back using an official work number. Also, social media. Always pays to review the privacy settings and profile information on social media accounts. Make sure that you know who can see your posts. If you don't recognise the caller, don't pick up. Let the voicemail do the work for you. After the show, we'll be sending you some more information about what you can do to protect yourself if you think you might be targeted by one of these spear phishing attacks. So we've already heard in today's show about how organisations have fallen victim to some major cyber incidents with, well, equally major consequences. But who is behind the attacks? Why are they targeting organisations? And what can you do if you find your own organisation in the firing line? Here to shed some light on the why, the how of cybercrime and cyber defence is Director of Advisory Services at BT, Tris Morgan. Hi, Tris, how are you doing? Dave, I'm very well, thank you. Fantastic. Right. So, in a nutshell, um, what can we say about who's behind these attacks? And, and what are the main reasons for the attacks? Why are they doing them? So, it's really interesting. Around 40% of businesses in the UK have suffered some form of attack or breach in the last 12 months, right. which, when you couple it with what Makoda was talking about, in terms of the impact of those breaches, is really quite significant. And it doesn't matter if you're a, a small business, a large business, whatever sector you work in, chances are you're going to be targeted and you'll suffer some form of attack imminently. Mm. When you, you look at the, the broader reasons for this, the digitisation of these organisations over the last couple of years in terms of how they work and operate, how they serve their customers, how they, how they work with their broader supply chain, those critical supplies, means that that attack surface has massively increased. And often security hasn't always been the key consideration. Through the criminal lens, we look at it in two ways. You have the outsider threat and insider threat. So outsider threat, we have these things called threat actors. These are the people in the groups trying to do harm to organisations. You have the nation state doing it for their own geopolitical purposes. Yeah. You have the criminal community doing it predominantly for financial gain. You have activists doing it for ideological reasons, such as environmental, um, and, and political, and then you have those who just like to do it for good fun, those, those script kiddies sitting in their bedrooms just fancy to having a go. On the insider threat side, it's easy to think of employees doing things that are malicious, and that is one part of it. Potentially some employees are disgruntled with the company where they're moving and will try and egress data intentionally. But also what we've seen is around 95% of data breaches happen because employees, like that LinkedIn request that you got, yeah. accidentally click on a link and, and therefore data leaves. And therefore it's important that we do a lot to support those employees. 
a lot of things to, to, to unpack there. Uh, going right back to, to, to the top almost, you talked about the journey that many organisations are on around digital transformation. And transformation is change. With change, there comes risk, of course. Uh, how can you make sure that when you are on one of these transformation journeys, that the new technologies, that the new, um, the new workflows, the new business processes that accompany that, that you aren't introducing risk as you're doing that? So, Digitalization is so important for businesses to transform and to grow and adapt. And as something that Kevin mentioned earlier, if you ensure security is a key consideration as your business strategy and at the board, and then as that flows down through a business, it ensures that those key decisions and those risks are evaluated at all stages. And then when you're looking at uh, technology and other um, security solutions, mm -hmm. those kind of key mitigations can be built in from the beginning, which not only reduces the risk, but also the cost over the lifetime. Uh, let's come back to the insider threats because you know, we've been talking a lot about threat actors and their motivations. I, I love all the acting terminology yep. here. But from the outside trying to get in, but what, if, what about the insider threat, whether it's someone who's acting independently or maybe a puppet from someone on the outside, the, the inside job, uh, inside man thing? Um, what can you do to detect those and then to try and secure yourself against that if they're already within the perimeter? So we call it the human firewall and in any organisation one of the best lines of defence is your employee base, whether it's one person or you've got hundreds of thousands of people, often they're the first route into an organisation through these kind of phishing attacks mm. and educating your employees to be able to, be, to spot these, to be vigilant and have a frictionless way of reporting these is absolutely paramount. Yeah, okay, so um, let's talk about incident response because you can do everything you reasonably can, can't you, to yep. try and uh, protect yourself against insider, outsider threats. But inevitably, maybe, uh, there will be some security incidents within your organisation at some point, maybe. What can you do about that? How can you best respond to that? Is, is there a playbook? Are there some best practices that you're able to share? So planning is absolutely key uh -huh. here. If you can imagine, you know, running a company, you get notified of a data breach. All of a sudden, you've got customers wanting to know how's their data been compromised. You've got media interest, potentially. You're trying to recover the data. You've got everyone in the organisation running around. That is going to be incredibly stressful and, and not efficient. The best thing to do is to plan, and I know you used to do some tabletop exercises with companies, yep. to go through and work out who's going to do what, how you're going to respond, and equally work with partners like us, like other companies, to do incident response. Make sure you've got the support that you need in case something happens. Equally out there, lines like action fraud, the NCSC have some really good guidance on how you can respond to an incident. And I guess one of the challenges, is it not, is the fact that, you know, we talked about the dynamic working environment as well. Transformation is happening, mergers, acquisitions, divestments, whatever else. And that means that how your organisation operates from a technology perspective as well as from a process perspective, many of, it, many of it's changing, it's quite fluid. If you do a, a, a tabletop exercise once a year, you're going to you're, you're drop a lot of balls in that. So how do you ensure that this becomes a constant process rather than a once a year tick box thing? We mentioned culture earlier, uh, that's mm -hmm. paramount. A culture, an organisation where you understand the importance of security and all these processes. And then when things change, we talked about supply chain. Your suppliers are going to be changing very frequently and uh, some research we saw recently showed that only 13% of businesses are looking at supply chain security. Yeah. So looking at that, ensuring you've got the culture where you're always reflecting on those policies, the processes, ensures that you can respond in the best possible way. But it will be very stressful. There's no taking that away. Yeah, and we saw supply chain earlier on feature very, very low down in our audience poll. Does that surprise you? I mean, we've, we've been talking about supply chain threats for a little while. D does it surprise you that it, it doesn't seem to feature higher up in the list of, of threats that organisations are trying to respond to? I think it, it does surprise me, but I think also companies often don't understand that their supply chain might not have the same security stance that they do. Mm. And so, and the point that Kevin made, you've got to look left and look right to understand how you're going to serve your customers, how you're actually going to get the goods into your organisation and working with them to help better their security, understanding what are their policies and procedures ultimately will better that organisation. Yeah, and another, finally for now, Tris, uh, another key part of that response thing is communication. You know, one of the 
what one of the breaches that I talked about earlier on, uh, while there was financial damage, it was the reputational damage that really cost them as a result of poor communication, poor media relations, frankly, during the course of, of the cyber incident. So that, that's another thing that surely organisations have to make sure that they've got nailed down well in advance of, of anything Exactly. Been happening. Yeah, those kind of key playbooks, who's going to own the, the kind of comm, but also ensuring that you can shield the teams who've got to do the remediation, the, the fact finding from some of that external pressure. Super stuff, Tris. Uh, a, a lot of really helpful advice there. Thank you very much. Uh, Tris will be on hand to answer your questions at the end of today's show. Great to chat with you. Chat to you again in a few minutes' time. Such a, a wealth of information and, you know, I think we'll pop over to the uh, BT Protectors again to see what they have to think about that. Um, here we go. Lindsay. Hi. Hi. How's it going? Good. Um, so we were talking about instant response with, with Tris a few moments ago, but what advice do you tend to give customers to try and prevent those cyber incidents from occurring in the first place? Well, we can help. Uh, in BT Security Advisor, we've got a lot of different assessments that we run to help evaluate a customer's security posture. Mm -hmm. um, one of the most popular that we run for small and medium-sized businesses is called a cyber maturity assessment. And this is where we use industry best practice frameworks and we compare our customers' controls that they already have in place and their processes against the frameworks to be able to come up with a, a gap analysis yep. and, and give our customers a tailored report um, with an overall maturity level assessment of their business and recommended prioritised steps of how, what they can do to improve. I love a good framework, but it, it's the next steps, you know, measuring yourself, you know, whether it's a maturity level, whether it's a framework and, and, how, you and how, you, how you fit in that, and, you know, maybe compared to other organisations in your industry. But it's the next steps. How can you make sure that an organisation not only measures themselves up against a framework or a standard, but is then able to take the next steps to ensure they're able to act upon it? So we also help our customers create plans to address the gaps. We can help with strategies and roadmaps. And when we're doing this, we're helping to draw on all of our previous experience from working with protecting BT, mm -hmm. but also loads of secure, s s small and medium-sized business across the world, um, yeah. large government multinationals and various government organisations. I think a lot of what we do in terms of reporting is also presenting uh, security risk. And yeah. so it's very easy for our customers then to take the recommendations to the board to help them uh, get the investment for the mm -hmm. security that they need to then put in place. Yeah, it's, it's about helping to build that business case very often. Yes. Uh, listen, Lindsay, thank you very much indeed. Something that we always like to do on The Future Is Now Live is to get under the skin of the tech that we talk about. So, delighted to introduce BT Enterprise Security Product Manager, Yasmin Mustafa, who's here to talk about Eagle Eye, and Safe Security CEO, Sakit Modi, who's here to talk about the Health Check platform. Thank you very much both for joining us. Uh, yeah, Yasmin, I'll come to you first of all. Uh, tell me about Eagle Eye, what is it and why are you so excited about it? Yeah, it's great to be here today to talk to you about Eagle Eye. Eagle Eye is our brand new cybersecurity defence platform and it supercharges the capabilities and services that we offer our customers today within Portfolio. The platform works by combining BT's industry-leading network insights combined with the latest advances in AI and automation so that we can predict, we can detect 
and we can neutralise security threats before they even get the opportunity to harm or impact our customers. This is fantastic because it means we're offering our customers a really dynamic security service and we're tailoring it to their needs. And we're doing that because the platform is constantly monitoring, it's constantly learning and it's constantly evolving to protect our customers. We've actually designed the Eagle Eye platform so it can self-learn, which is fantastic. So with every intervention, the intelligence that it's gaining from BT, the intelligence that it's been provided with to deal with the incident, it's literally continues to improve all of its threat knowledge and then it's dynamically applying that to the rest of our users who are benefiting from the platform. Continuously monitoring, continuously learning, continuously improving. Yeah. I wish I could say the same for myself. <laughs> um, we've got a video to uh, learn a little bit more about that. Thank Let's you. take a look. Eagle Eye is our transformational cybersecurity platform. It supercharges our security services. It combines our industry-leading network insight with the speed and efficiency of automation and advanced analytics to detect security threats before they form. Eagle Eye helps you deal with increasingly complex multi-layer attacks, which need coordinated safeguards to defend. Let's take a look at how an organization with Eagle Eye enhanced defenses responds to a targeted ransomware attack. Firstly, any attack needs a way into your network. The sheer volume of data now flowing through any organization means it's easy for ransomware to slip through. The most common methods for ransomware attacks are phishing, compromised remote access tools, or software vulnerabilities. Once in, the infection burrows deep into the endpoint, becoming immune to reboots or anti-malware tools. Then it reaches out to the attacker for further instructions. The threat will seep through your network, mapping every element, looking for as much sensitive data as it can find, infecting more endpoints with every minute. Then the ransomware will detonate. Only once the attackers are deeply embedded in your network will they tell you they're there, holding your data to ransom. Attackers know the security of your data is critical. They'll even threaten to make it public. Early detection and fast response is critical to keeping your business functioning. You need to be able to act before an attack begins stealing and encrypting your data. No single tool is perfect. If one fails to spot the threat, you can be confident that Eagle Eye's multi-tool monitoring will coordinate the response to keep you secure. Let's see this in action. At the delivery stage, it's all about knowing what to look for. Detecting a threat early enables the best defense, isolating the infection at ground zero. But critical alerts can be lost in the noise, especially when you're protecting an entire network. That's why Eagle Eye monitors events and compares them to the latest threat intelligence and our knowledge of cyber criminal tactics and techniques to immediately highlight priority incidents. If the threat slips through, it'll net expose itself when it attempts to get in touch with the attacker. Eagle Eye, with insights driven by its unique threat intelligence engine, looks out for attempts from your network to send traffic to suspicious internet destinations, telling us an attack could be underway. Not only does Eagle Eye tell your security gateway to block the connection, it goes further. It links the connection attempt with the endpoint that sent it, quarantining the affected device to prevent further spread. When time is everything, Eagle Eye was rapidly able to see across the whole network. It quickly discovered and responded to the attack before any human input was needed. Eagle Eye will also renew threat definitions and security policies across your network to make sure there's no additional risk from the threat. We immediately bring this learning back to the Eagle Eye platform, using it to help all our customers defend against similar attacks. Eagle Eye's early detection and action can be the difference between an isolated, easy-to-handle incident and a cascade of disruption. To find out how our Eagle Eye platform, combined with our decades-long experience, can supercharge your security, contact one of our specialists at bt.com forward slash security. Great to see Eagle Eye in action, Yasmin. And we've actually had a question for you from our audience. If your name is Mike and you ask this question, thank you very much indeed. Um, Mike asks, uh, what solutions are BT working on now to help protect small to medium-sized businesses in the cybersecurity space? And obviously, that was the point made earlier on. Easy to talk about the big businesses, but what about the small and medium ones? Yeah, it's a great question. And Michaelia alluded to the shift earlier. You know, we kind of have to bust the myth that smaller businesses aren't going to be a target when it comes to cyber breaches because there's no such thing as a small fish when it comes to cyber attacks. 
unfortunately, we actually know that every 19 seconds within the UK, there is a cyber attack on a business. And 83% of our small and medium-sized businesses aren't prepared financially to cover the cost to overcome that attack, which is really unfortunate. Um, so they are much more attracted prey yeah. for cyber attacks, especially if they are part of that supply chain that we're also talking about earlier. You know, if they're part of that supply chain, that could be the way in to perhaps reach the larger corporates. So we do have a portfolio within BT aimed specifically for our smaller businesses. Right. Um, we focus really on helping them to get the fundamentals right. So how do we help them secure their connectivity? How do we help them back up their data securely just in case they are held to ransom? How do we help them to secure all of their endpoints and lots more? We're a partner with the NCSC, the National Cyber Security Centre, and we're really keen that our portfolio reflects a lot of the guidance that NCSC actually gives to small businesses. Yep. And we ensure that the portfolio can be sold within its own right. It can also be sold with broadband business. Uh, it can also be sold with dedicated internet access lines. And we're going to be investing heavily even sure. more so this year so we can continue to help small businesses to continue to reduce their risk. Really good to hear. Yasmin, thank you very much. You. Uh, Saki, we've been hearing loads, uh, loads of cyber insights today, but in your opinion, from all the, all the threats that we've been hearing about, what would you say is the, is the biggest risk in cyber management right now and what can you do at SAFE to help reduce exposure to it? Thanks for the question, David. In my view, the number one risk that organisations face in their cyber risk management is getting their metric of cyber risk wrong. Okay. Think about it. I'm going to take a step back. Think of any cybersecurity event that any of our viewers would be seeing a year back, two years back, three years back, four years back. All of that would have one common theme. This year is the greatest year of cyber breaches. Yeah. It's almost like the iPhone launch. Every year is the greatest phone that gets launched. But guess what? Apple is right. It is the greatest phone that gets launched every year, the one that you're going to get in the new, uh, new thing. But exactly in the same way, cyber breaches are just going up. The problem is when the threats are going up, how does that contextualize to your environment? Mm. All the investments that you've made in your antiviruses, firewalls, and a dozen more cybersecurity products, how does that all add up to knowing exactly where you stand today yep. versus the external threats? And then putting that all together to see, are you doing enough? Maybe you are, maybe you're not. And then every single investment that you make for yep. every patch, every product, every consultancy that you take, how is that moving the needle? So the, the, the saying goes, you can't manage something until you can measure it. Exactly. So how, does, how does SAFE help there? And that's where SAFE comes in, which is an integral part of advisory and Eagle Eye with BT, where mm -hmm. it'll take API inputs from your existing cybersecurity tools, because you have a ton of them which would already be out there. Yep. And if it's not there, even that is signal by itself. It says, hey, by the way, out of the 50 categories of cybersecurity tools out there, these are the top three that you should be investing into. Yep. It takes those signals together dynamically, puts together all of that in a data science framework that we've co-developed with MIT, and then gives you a prioritized list of actions that needs to be taken in an automated way, mm -hmm. which will be coupled with a BT security expert as an advisor, and all of that comes in together packaged in a dynamic way, in an articulate way of what is the real risk you're sitting on to start your security management journey. OK, well, we can see a bit of that in action, learn a little bit more about it on another video. Let's take a look at that right now. Have you ever wondered if you can measure the cybersecurity of your organization? What if there is a solution that can give you real-time, predictive cyber risk posture across people, process, and technology. To address these issues, we have designed a scoring model that incorporates cybersecurity sensors data, external threat intelligence, and their business context. The scoring model places these together in a Bayesian network of a supervised machine learning scoring engine and gives out scores and the dollar value risk. Safe. Security Assessment Framework for Enterprise is a pioneer in digital business risk quantification, allowing organizations to measure and mitigate their cyber risk across people, policies, technology, cybersecurity products, and third parties in real time. SAFE integrates everything to a single dashboard and displays your overall cyber risk posture granulated to technology, asset groups, 
location-wise scores, policies, and compliance management, along with gap reports, prioritized actionable insights, and more. The compliance module displays the compliance status in percentage with respect to the global compliance standards, giving you complete control and transparency. The financial risk exposure feature provides the estimated dollar value risk your organization is facing, and immediately contextualizes cybersecurity as a direct business concern. With SAFE, your cybersecurity is simplified, and cyber risk analyzes focused, factual, and fast. So there we go, security assessment framework for enterprises. I've learned something constantly learning, Yasmin, today. There you go. <laughs> uh, listen, thank you both very much indeed. Great to hear about all of these exciting developments. It's time now for our Q&A. Time now to welcome back our guests to answer some of the questions that you have been asking throughout today's show. Uh, now, we've all just returned from Cyber UK and there was some pretty big industry news this week that's got us all talking. Uh, citizens across the UK are set to benefit from a revolutionary new capability which instantly blocks access to scam websites. Now, this new data sharing capability announced yesterday is available to all UK internet service providers. It's been developed by the NCSC, part of GCHQ, in collaboration with industry partners, and it can present ISPs with real-time threat data that enables them to instantly block access to known fraudulent sites. So that's the news. My question to you all, um, and Kevin, I'll, I'll come to you first of all, is, is this a game changer for our, our national cyber security? And of course, you know, I'm sure your customers watching will want to know what it might mean for them as well. Yeah, I, th I think this is fantastic news for the UK and, and just really sets out why the UK, I think, selfishly, is ahead of many other countries. So the technology that's used is, is really going to help every ISP better protect their customers. Now, from a BT's perspective, the good news for BT customers is this has been taking place for quite some time. We've been working with the NCSC since uh, 2014, part of Active Cyber Defence, and currently we block around 2 billion malicious communication attempts per month already. Mm. So this is really going to help sort of accelerate that, but also take it across sort of the mobile uh, space as well. As we know, we get scams. You had yours on, uh, on your mobile and you yeah. followed up by email. So you need to look at them holistically, but really positive news. I think the other thing it does is it gives confidence. Now, many people can say, I can go and get a block list, I can download one from open source. Do you really trust that when you get something from open source that it has the confidence that if you're going to block it, it is malicious? Because we have seen it where, sadly, domains have been blocked because people thought they were malicious. It turns out they were OK, and actually it's damaged your business. So yeah. I think it's a block list. It's automated and it comes with confidence as well. Lots of questions still to be answered on that, but I want to come to some more questions from the answers that you have been asking. And uh, uh, Jennifer, I'm, I'm going to put this one to you. Thank you if this is your question. Do the latest technical developments argue in favour or against the introduction of a worldwide digital currency and what are the risks? Uh, I'm thinking that part of the thinking behind that is... Uh, digital currency, whether it's running on blockchain or whatever, there is inherent security potentially in that that might make it more difficult for fraudsters and scammers to, to get access to it and, and to whip it away. Uh, what's your take? Have you, have you got any thoughts on that one? A, a, a whole separate whole discussion we could have. <laughs> Probably a whole other another hour discussion we could open up and have on that. Um, so we've, we've seen kind of two sides to the argument. Mm. 
Um, so, yeah, blockchain and can be there and it can have an open ledger so we can have it and we can use it securely. Um, what we've also seen is criminal actors using it to their own benefit as yeah. well. So we've seen that on, on the, the converse side and we've we've seen that, when it, especially when it comes to ransomware operators. And we've seen that end up being the seized amounts mm -hmm. of volumes of, of Bitcoin being seized a, across the world. So... When it comes to having a universal kind of digital currency, it, it really kind of would open up, and I, I guarantee I'll kind of hit the, the floor with a where, just what kind of level of discussion it would yeah. end up open up to, and I'm not sure I'll take up all of the time if, any, <laughs> if anyone wants to kind of chip in with anything there. It's it. I, I tell you what, let, let's park that one yeah, because no, I, I agree that that is a whole <laughs> hour, hour and 20 on its own. But uh, it, it's an interesting kind of thought exercise right now. And, you know, we're seeing some, some countries actually going a little bit Absolutely. further and embracing digital currencies, it, it, aren't we? It's got its pros and its cons, and it really does. And we've, we've seen kind of countries skip. So we've seen countries skip kind of moving forwards into not being able to have kind of those ways of having any form of a bank account and they've gone straight to a digital currency yeah. and they've gone there and it really has enabled progression in such a way. And so, yes, there's insignificant pros to it, but also we've got to be able to realise the risks that that does come with and being able to weigh that up. And that's the, that's the real reason it hasn't been able to progress in sure. such a positive way. If that's something you would like us to talk a little bit more about, then uh, we've got some news for you later on about how you can suggest maybe things that we can cover in future shows. But, Jennifer, thank you very much for now. Michaela, I'm, I'm going to come to you next. Uh, and then this question is, what do you see the main role of cyber... or uh, the main role of cyber security personnel evolving into in the next five years? How do you see those cyber roles changing? You know, we're talking about AI stuff here and you know, all of this new technology that's helping to protect organisations. What's that going to mean for cyber professionals? I think um, for cyber professionals, it's, I mean, it's arguably can make their job easier because actually the volume of things that they're dealing with will now be dealt with actually by the automation, by the machine learning, by the artificial intelligence but it keeps evolving. There's always going to be a role for the human being. Um, and we sort of call it almost human on the wire. So there's always going to be human intervention with emerging threats as the threats are new. Yeah. Um, and actually one of the talking points at Cyber UK this year was a sort of massive skills shortage. Um, and so I think sort of keep, you know, developing, there is a huge demand um, for people sort of not just in the mitigation of threats, but actually in advising organisations in what it is they can do, such as the advisory organisations. So I think sort of hopefully... Technology will take away the data fatigue and allow the professionals to focus actually on the more complex challenges um, and really helping those businesses. Yes, that's it. Artificial intelligence, you know, it's, help, it's humans working side by side with technology, not the technology replacing. Right, Kevin, I, you've got a thing. Yeah, and I think on this one, it, 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 it see it as an opportunity. I think where you are bringing in automation, you can't have it as a threat to, I no. bring in automation and that means I don't need these humans. It's, it's, it's an opportunity to increase skill levels, move move our colleagues up the stack and leverage automation for those, those lower tasks. So I think massive opportunity. On skills, Tris, I want, I want to come to you now with our next question. Thank you very much for all of these. Th th these are great. Um, where do you recommend organisations, or we here, start off with staff training? And what is the best way of finding a suitable partner to work with when the market seems to be flooded with them? BT's just, just, just one after all. So how do you find the right one that, that's the right fit for you as well as developing your own results? So, so coming back to your point about skills and then linking that to the partner, you've got to understand what do you want to do as a business? So if you look in the marketplace, there are thousands and tens of thousands of security companies, loads of managed service providers. What you've got to understand is which companies can help provide the skills and the expertise in the sector that I work in to ensure that you're getting the deep expertise and the right services. Good stuff, thank you very much. Uh, Final question, I'm afraid we've got time for. Uh, again, thank you. This one is for you, Kevin. Um, when the active threat land with the active threat landscape changing almost hourly, I think we can all nod along with that, uh, with C-suite IT tech struggling to keep up, I think our audience can nod along with that as well. How do you feel about immune style monitoring and learning with AI and automation being used to replace staff in a SOC? environment. Well, wow, great what a question. Word, yeah. uh, what, what a great one to end <laughs> on. So I think, look, look we've, we've, we've given you like a, a sneaky peek of eagle eye. That is about almost having that self-healing, that 
sort of the, the, the continuous learning, but it's going to augment your people. So as, as, we, as Michaela just said, human on the loop, human on the wire. Mm. It's about maximising that automation, but this is really closed close loop management. This is where actually the automation is taking the threat intelligence, could be taking uh, the NCSC's latest block list, and it's, it's automatically updating your policies and with Eagle Eye, we look at it to say, you've, you've got to update holistically. It's no point saying I'm automating just my firewalls yeah. because your endpoints are then going to be exposed. So absolutely, that's a trajectory that really we need everybody to take, but it needs actually the maturity of trusting automation has got to be a journey that goes with it as well. Oh, that's a difficult thing, though, trusting automation, isn't it? There's a, there's a change of, of culture and mindset that's required Massive. as well as a technological absolutely. capability in order to enable that. Yeah. And, and I think it's a journey. And this is where we're working with customers, recognising you're not going to start on day one to say we're, we're automating everything. It's going to say, OK, what are the tasks that you want to automate that's going to build the confidence up with your organisation? Some organisations are more confident than others. And coming back to sort of Tris's point is, really, what do you want to do as a business? How much yeah. trust can you place in it? And really set yourselves that aggressive strategy that says, OK, well, this is the outcome we want to achieve by when. Yeah, it's that holistic view, not in that silo cybersecurity thinking. It's the holistic view across the organisation. Um, listen, thank you. This, this has been an absolutely great discussion. Uh, I've got a small request to ask of you. As a lot of you will know, we always like to get uh, your feedback on the show and find out what you'd like to hear about in future episodes of The Future Is Now Live. Our charity partner is UNICEF, and it's at the forefront of the humanitarian response in the Ukraine. For every feedback form completed, BT will donate £3 up to £1,000. So, please do let us know your thoughts. It's very much appreciated. Sadly, that's all the time that we have for today. Uh, hopefully, as a result of our chats over the last however many minutes, you have everything you need to help outsmart cyber criminals and thrive whatever the threat landscape ahead of you. A big thank you for joining us this afternoon for The Future Is Now Live. And, of course, a huge thank you to our expert speakers, to Kevin, Jennifer, Michaela, Tris, to our protectors, Lindsay, Lee and Steph, and, of course, to Yasmin and to sack it. Uh, keep your eyes peeled for our next show in, uh, in the series, which we'll be announcing very soon indeed. But for now, stay safe, take care.